1942, Japan invaded Singapore. Dr. Lakshmi chose to stay and continue her medical practice by assisting wounded prisoners of war, many of whom were eager to form an independent army unit against the British. In 1943, Subhash Chandra Bose arrived in Singapore from Japan and announced his vision to form the women's wing of the Indian National Army. Dr. Lakshmi convinced Dr. Bose to give her the responsibility of raising the all-female army. Women, all civilian volunteers from the diaspora, attracted by Lakshmi's charisma and leadership skills, flocked to join. Mm -hmm. Dr. Lakshmi worked tirelessly to recruit, mm -hmm. raise funds, and convince the parents that their daughters would be doing something historic. Mm -hmm. Every woman who joined was called a Rani, and every single woman was untrained for military combat. Yet, they were ready to follow their commander with death-defying mm -hmm. courage into the steamy jungles of Burma to liberate India. Commander of the Rani of Jhansi Regiment, the world's first all-female infantry fighting unit of the Indian National Army, Dr. Lakshmi became Captain Lakshmi. The novice regiment of 1,500 women were trained rigorously for three months in tactical warfare and tough military exercises. They were taught Hindi and English and were single-minded in their objective, to fight bravely to defeat the British. Captain Lakshmi was a natural leader. Her infectious smile, her positive attitude, and her radiant personality infused courage in every woman and transformed each soldier into a Rani. Jhansi Regiment, RJR, was deployed to Burma to march towards Imphal, India. News of the RJR unit and Captain Lakshmi's daring reached India and thousands of young girls were inspired by her achievements. They marched secretly in their homes and on the rooftops of buildings to the INA's catchy marching song which was banned and declared seditious by the British. In 1945, Captain Lakshmi was taken prisoner by the British Army and held in house arrest for almost a year in Burma. She displayed exemplary courage and determination never breaking under pressure. Returning to India, Captain Lakshmi married Lieutenant Colonel Prem Kumar Segal and continued to serve her country in several avatars until her final breath at age 97. Freedom in three forms was her motto, political, economic, and social. She was a politician, a social worker, and even a candidate for the President of India. Doctor, warrior, pilot, soldier, politician, activist, freedom fighter, 
Padma Vibhushan, a brave heart who lived to see the fruits of her struggle and independence for her beloved India. Captain Lakshmi Segal. <laughs> Actually, what was more interesting is the research yeah. that went into it. I'm going to remove my cap. I want to ask you something about it. Are you comfortable in your uniform? No. Colonial construct. Yeah, you want to talk, say something about it? Well, I have to say one thing that um, looks very smart in pictures, yeah. very uncomfortable. Yeah. But uh, what, was, what was really amazing <laughs> was that um, the first time Mahatma Gandhi saw or heard about it, he was in such huge disapproval. He didn't think that it was most, he said it was most unbecoming. He shared that news with Netaji. Uh, the discoveries I made, Shalin, mm -hmm. while uh, researching this piece, uh, although it is a short cameo in a larger full-length work, was that as we recuperate these historical figures, we must also ask, who are we not representing? We are, um, you know, we have positionality, we have the voice, the microphone, but the fact of the matter is that the several hundred people that Lakshmi Segal was able to recruit was because Netaji saw in her a leadership quality. Plus, she spoke Tamil, Malayalam, English, and the majority of the women were of Tamil and Tamil and Kerala origin. These were women who worked in rubber plantations, not very educated, mm. and to be able to convince women of all kinds of identities. So we have very wealthy families in Burma. Gujaratis actually called the Mehtas, where a mother and two daughters enlisted. We have, um, we have, I told, we had Sikhnis, mm. Kors, we had a lot of Bengali women. And the fascinating thing was these women were all not born in India for, se for several generations, but they were escaping lives of drudgery. They were escaping lives sometimes of controlling or abusive homes. And there was this one kind of great burning goal to say, let's do something amazing. Let's do something that we would never in our lives ever have a chance to do. So if this one person was able to convince girls as young as 14 and women as old as 32 to just give up their lives and come, she must have had some, some charisma. The women were also not taken seriously by the men of the INA regiment because they said, it's not possible, this must be some PR stunt to tell the Indians, you know, let's give them some courage. These girls are just good for photographs, but they were actually taught like crash course training on how to go into the steamy jungles of Burma, how to proceed towards Imphal, and if something happened, how to retreat without being captured. They were given a lot of skills. But in the book that I read, read which is called Women of War, by Vera Hilde Hildebrandt, wife of one of the diplomats, they, she says, with all the women having left home, they were very miserable. Huh? They had this huge idea, we're going to do this, but then suddenly they missed home. And then all the men who were also, there was a lot of tension, sexual tension between the women's camp and the men's camp. But both guarded the RJR regiment extremely carefully because the Japanese army that was training them had comfort women for the, for the army. And it did not want the Indian women at any point to be exploited. So we've got this very interesting uh, canvas, yeah. you know? I can understand um, because you're talking about women who were a part of active freedom struggle, yes. who were erased or were not given the due credit. And then there are women who actually were 
invisibilized, you know, in yeah. this whole uh, the nation thing. One thing we here we have to talk about is how Gandhi and Bose, respects to them, did not think from a feminist view. Mm. They wanted women to fight along with them for the country, but they did not, you know, think from a women's lens. I think, well, I agree there because um, in 1927, Catherine Mayo came out with that book called Mother India. And in that, uh, this American nativist, she had such, she had such scorn for anything, the culture, the tradition, and they, she said, what kind of a country is ready for freedom when it treats their women so badly? And the women are not even educated. So it became one of those semiotic books. And I think the bourgeois men responded to Catherine Mayo's thing. And I think there was, at the time, there was the whole idea of education for women was also building. So I feel as if they made it a, a bourgeois project <laughs> to, to, you know, let's, let's prove her wrong. Yeah. Let's do this to show that our women are capable of much more. Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, a particular party does not, does not like Gandhi, they say, but I think they are repeating Gandhi's wish, version of women serving the nation, which is like serving the man. Like they do not have the agency to decide or represent, but they talk about women fighting for the country. Like, pe Pakistan hai, idhar pe China hai, both of you are enemies, go and fight. For them, they need women. Yeah, and then when the ministers make a mistake or when, uh, you know, uh, Pratan, whatever, he makes a mistake, they need women to defend them. That's the nationalism. That's what they think, you know, think about patriotism. But women fighting for, you know, civil rights, that has never been spoken about. So I think this freedom moment uh, does not include, it, does, it only talks about, you know, sending away British transfer of power from them to us. But we do not speak about the civil rights movement, especially people like Savitri by Pule or Pule. Both of them are freedom fighters mm -hmm. because they fought for education, the right to education. And then uh, you have Ambedkar who fought, you know, for public entry, you know, entry of temples, a civil rights movement which was happening at the same time in this country. I don't think the civil rights movement was not given much, uh, you know, prominence or respect or was even written about when it comes to freedom movement. Why is civil rights movement not a freedom right, you know, freedom movement in India is a question I, you know, keep here. So that's, that's the intersectional point I'm going to, you know, bring here. So, um, there are women who were not even allowed to wear blouses or cover mm -hmm. the upper body of, you know, uh, uh, they covered, allowed to cover their upper bodies. And then you have women who are fighting for the nation. Uh, who fought for them? The question comes there. Now, which is the arena where the, where the struggle happened? Yeah. You know, we were talking of, a, uh, there's a Captain Lakshmi Segal is one. Mm. And today, this morning, on, for the Republic Day Parade, after 75 years, we have... We've had more than 100 women percussionists lead the parade. And then we had, for the first time in 75 years, women uh, from the Army, Navy, and Air Force lead the parade. Has it taken 75 years? Women have fought to, to, to represent India in all the armed forces. And every, so my question is, do we have modernity without agency? That's, you know, that's what I'm asking. Are we still asked to, we're still fighting about the bindi and we're still uh, used for the LPG gas stove as yeah. if, you so, know, so that these are questions. And when you talk about Pule, there is somebody I want to talk about, but I'm going to get out of this colonial costume. Uh -huh. And I would like to introduce yeah. the next performer. Yeah. Um, she's Shobhana Narayan, and she's created a very interesting cameo of a 19th century Begum, a queen, Begum Hasrat Mahal, uh, who was sold at age four by her mother. Uh, and she rose with her brilliance and her determination to become the favorite queen of the Nawab of Awadh. So if those of you who have seen Shatranj Ke Khiladi, and if you remember it, the Nawab of Awadh is just playing chess and enjoying the music. His Begum was actually leading the army, riding an elephant and fighting the British. She kept them away for years from the kingdom of Awadh. Shovna Narayan is going to perform a cameo and then she will talk about Begum Hazrat Mahal. Wonderful to be here and I uh, congratulate the uh, Hindu Lit Fest for this excellent array of speakers and the, for uh, doing it for so long, ten to more than 10 uh, years. And, uh, and I'm grateful to them for remembering me on this beautiful occasion. Thank you very much indeed. I would like to also express my gratitude to Lakshmi Ji for uh, 
last moment help that she has uh, rendered. And thank you so much indeed. Um, well, I think uh, Anita has already introduced uh, Begum uh, Hazrat Mehel. And I just wanted to say that here was a woman who actually, uh, when the men around her had conceded defeat, she fought. She fought. She fought for her rights, what she thought was uh, the wrongdoings on, on, um, uh, on wrong grounds that was, ta the, uh, the, was taken over. She fought. And, uh, and here a woman who rose, who was sold at the age of four, became a courtesan, was sold to a courtesan actually, and then, and then came, entered the repertory, the parikhana of the Nawab, and um, became, um, and then our, his most favorite queen, the second Begum, she was officially given the title of the second Begum, bore him a son, Birjas Kadir, whom she later on, also after fighting the British, uh, put, uh, uh, pushing them out, she installed her son, minor son, as the uh, Nawab, ruled, uh, brought in uh, freedom of faith that, has, was being, that had been denied by the British, uh, set about reconstruction of Avad, but of course, peace was not there for long, and uh, there were constant pinpricks, and finally, uh, the British got the better of her, and she was sent off in exile to Nepal, where there is a, her makbara is there, her uh, coffin is there. And uh, I end with a poetry, few lines from her poetry written by her. In this little cameo piece, you'll find a music piece um, of uh, famous lines written by Nawab Wazid Ali Shah when he was being exiled to Matya Burj in Calcutta. And, um, as though he was leaving his uh, mother's home and going to uh, the husband's home, you know, to Sasural. And uh, so it's a very moving piece, and when uh, she refuses to accompany him. So, and uh, towards the end, I end it off with her couplet. Thank you. <laughs> Begum Hazrat Mehal, born as Mohammadi Khanam, was sold by her poor parents to become a courtesan. Mehak Peri, as she was known in the royal harem, caught the fancy of Nawab Wazid Ali Shah. She was and rose to become his second queen with the title Begum Hazrat Mehal and bore him a son, Birjas Kadir. But in 1856, under the doctrine of lapse, and charges of mismanagement of the state, British soldiers marched in, took over Awadh, sending Nawab Wajid Ali Shah into exile at Matya Burj near Calcutta. Begum Hazrat Mehal, second queen of the Nawab's state.
paid back and decided to confront the British. Touring even remote corners of the state, she motivated the dejected population of Awadh and raised an army. She, along with her band of supporters, fought the British forces. She seized power, installed her minor son, Bilge's father, on the throne while she herself ruled as regent. She set herself to the task of reconstruction of Avad and ushered in freedom of worship that had been denied by the British. But the mighty English did not lay quiet for long. In the fierce battles that followed, she herself led her troops, mounted on an elephant. For ten long years, she kept the English at bay. In her words, Begum Hazrat Mahal says, Aju ban ke jo dos aaye the vatan mein, na thi jiski ummeed thi wo burai. Ghadi do ghadi ke ye bhavar hai saare, abhi hogi khare arham se vihai. Zamana rakhega par apni nazar mein, meri sarf roshi, meri na rasai. It was amazing. And uh, uh, are the names changed for UP right now or is, this, is it still uh, no, Lucknow? And, I was uh, just informed that uh, there used to be a Begum Hazrat Mehal Chowk, uh -huh. which has been renamed mm -hmm. uh, to Atal Bihari Chowk. Okay. And there is a Begum Hazrat Mehal Park. So I don't know what's the fate of that. <laughs> yeah. There I have a point, because nationalism always is connected nowadays, or from those days, is about Brahmacharya. <laughs> and Brahmacharya has always been glorified. I don't know what's to be glorified about Brahmacharya. And people, women who live their lives, you know, uh, who embrace their sexuality, who embrace their, you know, feminine charm. I think the freedom movement want to showcase a woman who, is, who has cut her hair, who's wearing a <laughs> pant, who doesn't embrace her curves, or even In the In fact, woman. I would say that the freedom movement and particularly people like Begum Hazrat Mehal, mm. there were many of them. Mm. Uh, 
they actually mm. were proud women, mm. very proud women who had the interest of the nation of this land. They had it to their heart, very, very patriotic. And whether they came from the whatever community, that red light area, the brothels or a courtesan, or whether it was a simple housemaid, each one of them played a major role. We know of the big ones, but these were the ones who were working behind the scenes. In fact, a place like uh, the courtesan's court was uh, a place where a uh, lot of them were very rich and uh, they also utilized their richness, they gave it, they started supporting the freedom fighters and the freedom movement. But at the same time, they were using their femininity also because of the, where they were. But everyone came, it was a meeting place to pass on messages. Even through their um, music, dance, poetry, messages were being passed on. Uh, and you know, so that was the way, in fact, how broadcasting took place. So and there was a lot of political lobby happening. There was a lot of political uh, uh, aspect hap happening. They were active participants. Huh. And then... Uh, and they used their femininity. Yeah. They were not ashamed yeah. of their yeah. femininity. Because femininity, uh, nationalism or fighting for mm. um, uh, the country doesn't mean that you have to shed your mm. femininity. Yeah. So let's talk about Gandhi again. Let's gossip about Gandhi. Mm. So when these Tawais, these women, they went to Gandhi, when Gandhi was, you know, collecting funds, he said, give me jewels. And all the women were giving their jewels. Uh, I heard the Tawais of, you know, uh, UP went and gave the jewels. And what did Gandhi do with it? He uh, actually said that uh, he... He refused to take their Why? Why? What did he say? Uh, because uh, he felt that it was um, not the correct message would grow out. That um, So he was a little different in his point of view. Uh, but he accepted the fact that they were doing great work. Mm. That they were very, very nationalist and patriotic. Mm. But at the same time, he did not want to mm. use their money that had been offered by them. Mm. Uh, to support the movement and uh, because he thought that it was not correct. Purity, <laughs> chastity, the purity of nation, how a nation, you know, the concept of nationalism determines my bodily autonomy, which determines, you know, you're more Indian if you're sanskar. I don't know this word sanskar. An <laughs> MP, an woman MP, who, who just has, you know, you want to tarnish her name, she just has a glass of whiskey with a short dress and she, and you just want to, and she's not Indian, she's anti-Indian, she's having whiskey. And you just have a picture of another MP, another man who's drinking or his dressing has nothing to do with his character, you know, or his patriotism or his nationalism. So why are you placing your nationalism your sense of pride in my body. Why are you determining is marital rape a, not a crime? Why are you determining? Or why are you determining, you know, a lot of things about women's body, even today? Let me say, you know, from uh, maybe I, I may not be liked what I, I'm going to say, uh -huh. but I feel that, you know, when you somewhere feel that you have to... Uh, put your ego first mm. and you know, and that you have to rule, mm. you have to make a point. Mm. I think it is the male, male ego, mm. the male uh, uh, aspect, you know, of showing that I am the boss. Yeah. And so whatever I do, whether it's wrong or right mm. is right, but where the other female has to do whatever, according to my perception, she should be. Now that perception, unfortunately is far from reality yeah. because uh, so it is it just shows the insecurity i would say insecurity in a particular gender who was, who are unable to come to terms that there is also an equal aspect you know that the other gender mm. can contribute can be behave can whichever whatever be her behavior pattern it doesn't matter but that but to come to uh, to accept it 
and to come to terms with it is very difficult. Yeah, so that's why, because you have the Romeo squad, you have the love jihad concept, Anita is joining us now, and then you have nationalism associated with controlling who I fall in love with <laughs> or, you know, uh, something that says who I marry or who I have sex with. Is my country going to decide that? Uh, not the countries. I, I mean, if you even look at our scriptures, mm. uh, if you look at Kunti, she mm. decided mm. who she was going to, uh, you know, sort of uh, the, uh, the, all her... Uh, you know, how, how would she beget her sons? Mm. So she decided, nobody else. Mm. So that is not, that is part of our uh, scriptures, or, I mean, not scriptures, I would say part of our uh, acknowledged, uh, mm. accepted mm. Um, uh, history is that we, women have decided, but what happened? Somewhere, I mean, men decided that women cannot decide. So, and therefore all rules and regulations and framework were put in. But that happened largely. It was a, a crumbling society even earlier. I mean, if I start looking at it in the uh, post-Gupta period, but it sort of, uh, it was the medieval period where you saw this uh, really being solidified. And that the, even women themselves became party to it because then they started uh, going inward. So they allowed, they acceded pay, space for the other trend of thought to dominate. So it is now that, you know, women are coming out. I mean, the last 200 years have shown that even though there were pockets of women, uh, even during those times, uh, who came out, but yet now it became much more. Where many more came out on the streets. Yeah, at that point, Anita, I want to ask you something because we are discussing. I mean, the chairs could have been said this way. Okay. Uh, mythology. Nationalism yeah. and mythology. I wouldn't say it, it is only applicable to Indian nationalism, mm -hmm. even to Tamil nationalism. They glorified Karnagi. They built a statue for Karnagi because Karnagi was very subservient to her husband. Husband just was a womanizer, you know, we went around, he came chastity. back. Chastity, she yeah. represents chastity. Yeah, and she yeah. was waiting for him. Faithfulness. Yeah, and uh, they glorify, and I think the Tamil politicians or the Dravidian politicians, they want the, you know, they want to tell you, I want my women to be like that. I think that's mm -hmm. the way they glorified Kannagi. Uh, you have any point on nationalism and mythology? <laughs> It's a very interesting story. I'm going to make it quick. When Pons wanted to start manufacturing in India, makeup, the, they wanted they set up a distribution office in Bombay, but the rule was it has to be manufactured in India. And at that point, we had TT Krishnamachari and uh, C. Rajagopalachari in the central cabinet. And the TTK group of industries was uh, given the license. So TT Krishnamachari said, conflict of interest, pass the file. And, uh, and Rajagopal Achari said, why do Indian women need makeup? Sita was naturally beautiful. So Sita's recall, this is, this is a recorded story. Sita's women don't need makeup. Look, Sita never needed makeup. So file went to Pandit Nehru and he wrote a letter. Maybe Sita was naturally beautiful and didn't need makeup. But I think Indian women will be very happy if makeup is made available to them. So. So I would also is, like to add over Sita here. Sita is brought in. Yes. The mythological characters are brought in uh, whenever convenient. And they will still continue to be brought in. Uh, so that is, that is my And the solar shringar was always there. So they've forgotten completely <laughs> about the solar shringar, which has been there extolled in our texts throughout in all our poetries. So we actually beautification and self-beautification even by... by Men also, but by, by, by women were all, was always there. But Make can up. I just say Make something, up. Shalin? You said something about the controlling about who can love, who, can, who you can marry, who can do this. There is, we still have so much. We've got all the Romeo squads run, you yeah, know, yeah. going yeah, around. We've got honor killings yeah. that are still continuing. And you have a story about honor, uh, you know. I have, honor. yes. And I have to mention my great aunt, my, grand, my grandfather's younger sister, T.S. Soundaram and uh, who was a, married at 12, a widow, even while she was a teenager, and sent in the early 30s, she was born in 1904, sent at age 32 to Delhi to become a doctor, to Lady Harding College. There she got involved with the freedom movement and fell in love with another doctor who was of another caste location. Huge family 
uh, you know, resistance. The family that thought progressive and sent her to Delhi to become a doctor suddenly sort of clamped up. Mahatma Gandhi intervened, made them sit, stay apart for one year and see if you still feel that way about each other. And they did, and they got married. Uh, Kasturba Gandhi gave her the, the sari. And all her life, because she d devoted her life to founding Gandhi Gram near Dindigal, all her life she faced that pressure. She faced that pressure about the fact that she married from, you know, from a different caste identity. And she, she had to resist. There was so much emotional reserve that she had to, had to you know, rustle up for herself. Because there was always somebody uh, with a jive. But she stood up for herself. So this was pre-independence. Yes, but, right. but 1904. And yeah. I'm talking of 1947 when she founded uh, Gandhi Gram. Mm -hmm. And it continued to 1980 when she passed okay. away. So Gandhi intervened with this also. Yes, he I mean, intervened. I don't know, what's with Gandhi? <laughs> I mean, I'm a Gandhi <laughs> study scholar. But even when Indira Gandhi and Faroz were in love, Nehru goes to Gandhi to tell, you know, please, you know, separate them. And I'm like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I loved you so much. Uh, I loved you so much. And this is what you did to me after reading history. So agency, we, talk, we spoke about agency. Are women really free in India to choose who they want to marry? That is that's where they say our oh, families are very safe here is family a safe space for women because because of caste caste is a big problem here as i said you place the nationalism in my body your national pride in my body you are you have placed caste in your women's uteruses and then you want to protect it you don't want them to intermarry so that caste purity goes off and it becomes a very, you know, egalitarian society. So even now, the honor killings, for example, you know, she says a lot of things have changed, but I'm a Dalit activist, like, you know, every year, you know, every day, every week, a man is killed, you know, from my community for being in love. And this is something which pains me, you know, that, you know, we cannot choose. And what has changed for this country as India, or the state has worked towards eradicating the caste system, you know. See, I am, uh, you know, not free. You know, nobody is free until everyone is free. Yes. So today when you talk about freedom, 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 as a person, as a Dalit woman, I am not free. You know, uh, I can't even say the word Dalit in a lot of places in my country. And uh, my women are not free. Access to resources is a problem. And there's a lot of issues. And then, I think all, you know, as I said, India is a man, India is still a man, and uh, all the freedom fighters too came from the upper caste and upper, you know, class thing. That's why we, we all think that freedom movement is an upper caste thing, but a lot of people contributed no, to no, it. No, no, there are a lot of people contributed, except that we don't recognize their yeah. contribution. The history is... That is a yeah. different matter. The but way uh, they write. Huh? They are there. So it is always considered that. So what happens is there was this one man who actually resigned his job he resigned his, he was a Dalit man, a Dalit getting a post of the law minister, the first law minister of India. He cried in the parliament, he cried in the parliament and he resigned. He said, I'm resigning for the women of this nation. Why? Because of the Hindu court bill was not passed. You know what Hindu court bill says, right? Uh, it gives you the right to, it gives you right, uh, right to consent. Um, criminalizes trafficking of women, uh, it gives you, you know, uh, property rights, you know, all the rights, you know, whatever women we have right now is because of the Hindu court bill, but later the, Kong, you know, the Nehru's government and Indira, you know, all the government passed it. But we as women, not just Dalit women, but we, you know, someone who's fighting for the, you know, a domestic right, hmm. or someone who's fighting for her dignity, like, you know, uh, someone who has a job which she likes, all, you know, the, the constitution. Uh, may I just interject? In Hi. spite of all the rules and regulations and constitutional uh, provisions we have mm. for women's rights and Hi. equality, mm. are we practicing it? Yeah. Are we practicing yeah. it? Uh, it? Whether it is the educated or the uneducated, whether it is of this uh, class or that class, whether of this caste or that caste, are we practicing it? I think we need to really look into ourselves and yes. hold a mirror And here to I want to make a point, because I want to make a point. The history of India is not between this party and that party. The problem of India is not between Hindus and Muslims. The problem is very deep. It's ingrained. It's nuance. It, you know? And then nationalism. And this concept of nationalism from the right, which is about hate, 
and divisions. And then you have a particular party which calls itself liberal. Its concept of nationalism is tolerance. I'm like, who are you to tolerate me? I don't need both. I need love, acceptance, equality, and equity. So the Constitution gives me that, wonderfully said. So I need a nation based on the values of Constitution. Today is a beautiful day for women, especially for women. It was very intersectional because it covered all women. It covered all women. So, the, you know, the concept of nation is beautiful, but, are we, no, but the concept of constitution, you know, constitutional morality and social morality are lacking in this country. So how would, how would I be proud about the nation when my women are not free? So you have anything to say about it? That, it brings me to the question of what is freedom? Freedom is expression. Now, we might get a political freedom, but we need to have freedom from the fear within ourselves. Because even as women, a lot of us are chained by fear. What will society say? What will I do? What will I do? And so I think we need to get rid ourselves of that chain, that chain which is binding us within. And it is happening, it is still binding a lot of women of our country in I, spite of everything. But I would like to defer. I think we have to be so careful today about what we say. We have to watch every word we say. It's always multiplied, amplified. Nothing is not recorded. Nothing is not shared. And I think uh, there is far more policing in what is happening. There's all new terminology, uh, dominant caste, marginalized caste, and we have to learn as we go. This panel itself is so interesting, and I know it's going to uh, you know, uh, generate a lot of other kinds of opinions, but I'm so glad, I'm happy that we are actually, we need to talk. We need to talk and discuss and argue and disagree, because I think that we, we, you, you can all think we've taken so many steps forward, but from a, per, from a position of privilege, you have to acknowledge that unlearning is very hard and learning new ways is equally hard. And unless we talk to each other, and we have this estrogen energy that flows across party lines, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we are not going to be able to affect change because otherwise we are just puppets. We have to always negotiate our space and our freedom. Yeah, left or right. Left or right. Left or right. We, we need to find our places, find our space. Yes. Be intersectional, question the men. Yes. Talk for all genders because yes. it's not, gender is not binary anymore. Yes, it's not it's binary anymore. There's a lot of things to be done. Yes. So I think uh, if, I'm, if we are going to leave something today, uh, the constitution or the Hindu code bill, I'm saying it again and again because it's about equality and equity. It talks for everybody but with fair justice. Yes. So that is something which, you know, fair, you know we need to focus on. And I think uh, since Sashi took a lot of her time, yes. uh, we are... <laughs> <laughs> He's got a big fan base, and uh, we our time's up. And uh, time's up. The, yeah, if you have a QT okay, session, to, we'll have. Yeah. Or do you we'll want finish? to take one I question? Think, uh, Any one I question? I think we're running for yeah. Yeah. time. You can Anybody? Just take one, yeah. question. one question. Yeah. Just one, please. Yeah. Like the heading says, "Imagine women nationalists." Imaging. Sorry. Okay. Imaging, right? So you went and asked to vote for RG. Why you didn't say PG? Sir? Ima imaging women nationalists, and you went and asked us to vote for RG. You made him a woman? If you want me to go fundamental right now, I would say, this, as I said, both the parties are very, um, I would say, very patriarchal. I, that's what I said in the beginning. The electoral politics of this country, be either left or right, is very patriarchal. It is male. That's what I said. And that was a joke because people might think, bad. I'm taking a ticket. Rahul Gandhi, I was nervous in the first five minutes. So, yes. <laughs> Uh, I would say, you know, uh, political autonomy for women. Uh, I think Mayavati is a very good example of political autonomy, but there was a point where she was shamed, where, you know, someone, you know, I want to talk this point, since he raised, you asked to vote for RG. If I ask to vote for Mayavati, if I ask to vote for Mayavati, I will be called a traitor by the same group of people. And Mayavati, 
you know veer das veer das got a grammy right what he got grammy or emmy ha so he doesn't sing he only blabbers so veer das got an emmy where veer das made fun of mayavati's body and sexuality in a very way and he wins an emmy and i don't want a country which laughs for his jokes over his jokes i laugh at you veer das i'm telling you here and you know so this is this is where this is an, because we should have another session for that we yeah. should have another session where you so, have yeah. to give me two hours to speak about dalit women politics but yeah sorry thank you for the question because of that i was able to make my point thank you so much thank you so much shalin yeah. anita shobhana ji thank you for that very very powerful session